Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. I cannot believe it. We are back in 2007, or as the statistician has said to me and the other guy over here, the world is even higher. Prices are selling at the highest price ever. What is going on? So today, I've brought together these individuals plus one sane banker to provide their insight on the investment market and what's happening in New York City. My guests, they include Aaron Youngrice, who's the principal at Rosewood Realty, who thank God for the Sabbath so he could take a day off. Brooke Chanfiki, who is the group manager at M&T Bank. Nat Rocket, who's the executive vice president at Cushman and Wakefield. And last but not least, the man who I call the statistician, my buddy, Robert Knackle, who's the chairman of Massey Knackle Realty Services. Now, I heard uh, there was like a disagreement between you and Mr. Uh, Youngrise before. Uh, he says the market is better this year in volume and everything, and you disagreed, Mr. Knackle. What? Well, I think the statistics show that things aren't quite as hot as they were last year. Last year in the city, uh, we had 41 billion in sales. If you annualize what occurred in the first quarter of this year, we're running at about 26 billion in terms of number of buildings sold. Um, last year, we had 4,100 properties sold in New York City. Annualizing the first quarter, we're on pace for about 2,200. Uh, so we, but we expected that. But the fact is, the market is very, very hot. Uh, the low interest rates are the driver. And yes, Michael, what you said is absolutely true, that prices per square foot are higher today for almost every property type in every neighborhood, with the exception of Midtown Office, and Midtown Office is about to pass through its peak from 2007. Uh, and the, the thing that is concerning to us uh, is that the increase in price is not predicated on enhanced fundamentals as much as it is low interest rates. Fundamentals have gotten better, uh, but the fact is that the low interest rates are really the rocket fuel that's driving the market, and that is not a very healthy thing. Banker. Do you agree with him? Um, I, I would agree. I would agree that you know the the fact that interest rates have remained so low for so long and continue to look as we forecast out to remain low for at least the next you know six months to a year. If I had a crystal ball, I'd be a billionaire. We'd we'd all be billionaires and, and know what's going to happen you know six months from now. But I think today, absolutely, with interest rates as low as they are, money is very cheap. You can get good long-term rates. You can lock things away. But aren't you worried a little bit that some of the, what Bob just said and, and what I think is agreed by Nat and by Aaron is that these prices are really crazy today? 
as long as the structure, I'm, I'm looking at it from a banking perspective. But you're looking as, long as, as you're looking at it as a consumer. As long as there's banker, enough equity but, coming but in. Aaron said before, uh, talk about this deal that you saw in the Bronx recently. Well, some yeah. of the deals that I'm doing in the Bronx, uh, buyers are getting 75% LTV and about 10, 15% NES. Most of them are still getting the 70, 75% LTV deal. Are you seeing this, Nat? Are you seeing buyers getting these type of yields, which is allowing sales to, to allow everybody well, to you know, get I that think busy? that there's a, a lot of concern in the marketplace, I think, generally speaking, about where pricing is and sort of a visceral reaction to pricing and, you know, it's higher than it was and fundamentals aren't as good and why does that make sense and it's interest rate driven and that's a problem. And I think the rocket fuel is actually, I'd use the analogy, the nitrous oxide, right? I mean, the way the market usually works is, you know, it, it stalls out. And the, the, mot the motor starts running, its fundamentals are driving it, prices are going up, rents are going up, businesses are expanding. Yeah, but you know what? And then the debt hits and boom, the thing takes off and blows up, right? But it's been reversed this time. We've had the debt first and the fundamentals really haven't come. So I think we're all having this kind of gut check when we know that this is what fuels the, the, the blow up. But I think that actually fundamentals can catch up. I don't agree that prices are crazy. I mean, I think in the context of the 10 year, you know, a four cap isn't crazy, right? If we're talking about spread treasury and risk, a four cap isn't crazy if it's a good asset. But, you know, we're talking about land prices. I, I you know, land prices at as high as $1,000 a square foot, you see? Well, it's exceeded 1000 in some neighborhoods now, and this is something that we saw coming. I mean, today's uh, seven or 800 a foot was yesterday's 400 a foot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is of great concern uh, is that land has probably gone up in Manhattan, south of 96th Street, by as much as 30% in the last three months alone. And land always rallies about 18 months to two years before a downturn. And we've seen it, an almost irrational rally in the land market. So, so he, here's the question. Are you selling uh, development sites or most? Mainly multi, but I want to just echo what Nat said before. I'm looking at deals now in the, in the office, and we look at them and we say, wow, look at this, it's a crazy price. But we look at the deals we sold three months ago and we go, wow, that was a great deal. I'm saying the same thing now. So maybe today we're saying it's a crazy price. Three months from now we might look at it and say, wow, that was a good deal we sold in the Bronx or the Heights or in Brooklyn or Manhattan. So all the deals I sold six months ago are bargains now. But you, you were saying your volume this year is even higher it's than last higher. year. It's about 40% higher. And is Dollar volume is about the same, but more deals. Is it mostly multifamily? Almost all. I'm doing, right now we're doing about a deal a day. Almost. And who's, who are the buyers today? The buyers are mainly individuals, families. One institution we're selling a lot of multifamily to, but the rest are. And what type of institutions? I mean, uh, private equity funds? I mean, how do, are other yeah. people saying? Yeah. And what are you saying? Well, you know, it's interesting. Bob was talking about, you know, how the volume is down. Um, and statistically, I agree that's true. But I think there was kind of an interesting... The, the end of the year last year was kind of an interesting moment in time. I mean, I'm sure we all remember it or maybe don't so much, right? It was such right. a clear, I, right? I, I remember the end of the year, as you know, because of the change of the tax law, right. everybody's going to sell, and then, then we're going to have death in the first mm -hmm. quarter. Right, so the first quarter, But the I first think, quarter wasn't death. I th well, I think the first quarter was muted as a result of, the, of all the deals. I mean, 42% of total volume last year occurred in the fourth quarter. Total volume, 42%, and the entire marketplace occurred in the fourth quarter. That's an amazing statistic, I think. Yeah, there were more buildings sold in the fourth quarter of last year than any time in the history of New York City real estate. Yeah. So there had to be, it had to suck some energy out of the first uh, quarter. And, and we saw on the institutional side was that because of the doubt about tax code and so on and so forth, some of that RFP process that would have occurred, you know, November, December didn't, and it lapped over into January, February, March. So that volume is sort of now beginning to happen. So I think on the brokerage side, we're seeing on the street what's going to be in the statistics in three, four, five, six months. And we're feeling the, the energy. If When we look forward, we're seeing pretty substantial increase in total volume. If you look at what's closed, which oh, is small, but, but what's on the, the market, question. and, and, what's, and, uh, and I'm going to ask Brooke her opinion mm -hmm. also. There, there are different product types. What Aaron is saying and what he's doing the majority of is multifamily. Mm -hmm. And multifamily people like because people have to live here. More people are moving to New York City. There's always a need. Doesn't matter of the pricing. Multifamily is doing well. I had lunch with somebody in our good mutual friend yesterday who took a property on 6th Avenue. He said, two years ago, I thought I'd get $65 a foot. I'm getting $85 a foot, and I'm not paying any brokerage or anything else. So that's wonderful, okay? You know, the, the world is great over there. Um, that's multifamily. 
The office market, office market is not great. Right, well, it depends on geography. Actually, we get Midtown South. No, okay. yeah, <laughs> Midtown South is doing great, and areas that you wouldn't think are traditional office markets. It's a little more challenging in Midtown uh, and downtown. I, I mean, Brooke has, uh, you know, in, in her portfolio, they did a loan uh, for Kaufman a couple of years ago, and uh, the property just recently went to contract to double the price. It, had, mm -hmm. it was like a two and a half, three year hold. But that was close to Midtown South. It was a neighborhood in transition mm -hmm. over there. Um, but, you know, some of the Times Square is there. But I don't think Lower Manhattan is office buildings doing that great. I don't think Brooklyn office buildings are doing that great. I think it, it, it's, it, it's depending on the location. Well, Michael, it depends on the economy, too. If you <laughs> look at all the sectors of commercial real estate, office leasing probably is the most closely tied to the broader economy, and the broader economy has been sluggish by any measure. Right. The office leasing market is down. The retail market is fine. The hospitality market is doing well. I mean, look at, look at these vacant sites being sold for four or $500 a square foot. There are more hotels coming on the market. The office leasing market is absolutely the, the I wouldn't say it's challenged today, but I would say that anecdotally what we're hearing from clients is there are a lot of requests from potential tenants for under five-year terms. So there really? is, yeah, th there is uh, not a tremendous amount, but in certain locations, sort of um, areas where they're not yet tried and true office markets yet, they're thinking, let's try it out. Let's do you, do you realize that you can get prime office space on Park Avenue today at 299 Park for like $60 a foot? Well, I think that's okay. that's to some degree the point. I, I'm not sure that I 100% agree that the office market is down. I mean, I think as a statistical statement, that's probably accurate. But I think it, it really... Sixth Avenue, where you are? Well, the, right, and, and I think that's exactly right. What, what you see is that there's the piece that catches your eye, right, which is the big you know, deals, the, the banks and so on and so, so forth making deals, the Sixth Avenue deals. Those get catch your eye, but those aren't the market, right? Those are, those are a piece of the market. That part, piece of the market is suffering, but the, our clients that have smaller buildings, smaller footprint space, you know, they're doing deals. They have demand. They're getting, they see some pricing strength. It's not dramatic deal to deal. But each deal, they ask another 25 or 50 cents, and they get it. Absolutely. I'd say the Class B office buildings are actually doing relatively well, mm -hmm. the things that we have in our portfolio. Absolutely. Now, what, what about, uh, we were, Bob just brought up the fact that uh, $1,000 a square foot. I'm, I'm going to put it on the banker's point of view uh, because I've seen some requests today. Yes. There was, there was no market. There was no money available with the exception of, let's say, the Starwood Capital or the mm -hmm private equity funds or, you know, or, or maybe the REITs or something like that who would finance raw land. Today, land is being financed. Yeah. Land is being financed, and in certain cases, people are giving 60, 70 percent the purchase price. Not often. Not okay, often. Okay, but, but why? It is happening. I think that the, if you, if you narrow it down to the luxury condo segment and you look at the, um, you look at just over the past short while that particular market and how deep that market seems to be. We don't know how deep it is, but how deep it seems to be. With the numbers climbing the luxury residential market, $1,000 a square foot makes sense if you can sell out at 3500 to 4000 Now, as a banker, if my basis in that land is sub 200 Ah, but I'm, I'm happy. Oh, okay. If it but, starts but, to but, climb. But, but, but what we're saying, what you're bringing out is your basis is low. Where I'm talking about people on transactions that I've seen where people are spending $700 and they're asking the bank to give them 70%. They're not talking, so their basis is 500 There might no, be Michael, structure this, elements that, that make that work. There you know, might I, be. On this transaction we have under contract in Tribeca, it's a thousand dollar land price and the purchaser there has gotten a, a construction loan at seven hundred dollars a foot. For, you mean the land? Right. But from a structure perspective, as long as you have, if, if it's the right borrower, it all comes down to sponsorship, if it's the right structure, the right, you know, dare I say the word guarantees, the right uh, reserves, but I, all of but, that together but, might what make, I, make What sense. I'm seeing is, you know, how, how, uh, how, how quick could you sell a building today? Two days. Depends. Depends on the, oh, the price, where a it day. is. A day. A day, two days. Most yeah. of the deals I'm getting, I'm, they're gone within a week. Why? You have to create the frenzy. You have to... I'm, 
But where's the short upside? Show. Imagine okay. a broker. He can't tell you. No, 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 no. Give me a life story show. And okay. I'll tell no, you. no, no. But what I'm saying to you is this: no. somebody wants to own. Everybody wants to own New York City. There is no question. People like to own multifamily <clears throat> because you know, as opposed to a hotel, you're not every day worrying about in and out because moving out is not an operating business over there. Um, but you know. To say that something is being sold in two days, I mean. No, we, we generally don't sell things in two days. We'll take two two weeks or two okay. months and get 100 bids, and then you, you Look, really flush they, out they top dollar. They put together the most beautiful <laughs> marketing books. I put together a one-page thing. It's a scrap paper, and it's the building, and that's it. But, Michael, you ask why. You ask why. The, the reason, uh, the answer to why is because opportunity returns on alternative investments is so low that low yields on real estate looks great today mm, and right. the amount of foreign we'll, capital wait the, the amount of foreign capital that is pouring in because of the relative economic security we have and the relative political stability we have here relative to other countries if you have a lot of money somewhere around the world you want to diversify you want to put some money in the united look, states look, and the, new york real estate look, is a great chinese place to do it the chinese have went into williamsburg you mm -hmm. know there, there's That's no right. question about that but the market the stock market has increased, so you know certain people might diversify and say, "Hey, I'll go into the market because I think I can go into that." And many people say, "I want to go into the residential market," uh, you, you know, over there. But you know, you're talking the residential, and I think the window, the window that we talk about on the luxury condo market, you know, it's a question of if it's shovel ready, you know, how long mm -hmm. it's going to take, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, when the music stopped in 2008. A lot of those things you sold the notes because the music stopped. You know, you sold the properties because the music stopped over there. So you don't want to you don't want to be the the last person to the dance, and you don't know. I mean, as we all said, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what the uh, when it's going to be the next opportunity. And we're, we've been talking a lot about the sort of the pushing the edges on loan to values and being able to get more and more and more out of uh, financial institutions today. The one thing that I will say fundamentally that still is in place though is structure. At least that's how... I would how believe it's in, it's in place with you. I would believe in some of the banks, but I did a show a couple weeks ago and I, I've written about it numerous times. There are a lot of new players who are coming into the market who believe that the streets are paved with gold in New York City, and some of them are spreading to get business, like we were talking, and they're giving maybe 80% loans. Maybe they're giving the 70% over here. There are banks from the Midwest who say, hey, I, I don't want to lend in Dubuque, Iowa. I want to lend in New York City. I'd rather do this. Uh, you know, it's a different market. The same way that you just brought up very eloquently that you know you don't get yields over there over there so these banks today are fueling this investment sales too mm -hmm. because they're providing more debt yeah michael it's always a battle between fear and greed and when greed takes hold greed snowballs and then fear sets in and that's why you have cycles throughout markets you know, so, we, we so had, what do we have now do we have fear or do we, we have greed? greed. We, we have, have greed. greed. I was actually talking to Rob Shapiro from Massey Knackle the other day, and we were just talking about the prices. I said, Rob, this is crazy. He goes, yeah, maybe it is, but where else are you going to find a deal in Washington Heights that you can get a 4% return with low rents? Where else are you going to put your money? And, you know, I couldn't argue with him. And he's my, you know, colleague. We do business together. He was right. So. You know, I think the, the sort of sense of, you know, a market that's overheated is fundamentally based on a sense of what is a reasonable rate of return. Right? I mean, we all have a kind of internal definition for what that is. And to some degree, you know, this, this market may be crazy relative to that, but is it crazy relative to, you know, the real benchmarks? Is it crazy relative to a 10-year T-bill? No. Right? And, and I think that we're in a place where there could be persistently low interest rates, and not for two or three years because the Fed says so, but because there are economic reasons that are going to hold interest rates low for a long time. I mean, you ask, you know, why is there all this demand? <clears throat> you know, why are people piling into real estate? <clears throat> There's demographics to it too. You know, fixed the, income assets are going to be in higher demand, right? And real estate's a fixed income asset in essence. 
Michael, the, the answer is that nobody knows what the heck is going to happen. We're in an unprecedented environment. We've had unprecedented government intervention. The money supply in the, co in the country is fourfold what it was four years ago. The Fed's balance sheet is six times what it was. No one knows how this is going to unravel, and that, I hope, that rates stay low in perpetuity. Because I tell my guys in the office, every day rates stay low and, is a good and day. And the president threatens to raise capital gains again. <laughs> so, uh, well, well, but we but, don't, but, we don't know okay, how it's but, gonna unravel. Okay, but that brings up an interesting point. What happens if capital gains go up? What happens if the tax structure changes? I still remember, since I'm older than all of you people here, I remember when there was something called the tax shelters. And I still remember, it was in 87 that the world ended. Literally the world ended because real estate was sold not for economics. Real estate was sold on tax deductibility. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you would buy something and oh I don't care, I'm gonna get the deductibility. And when that happened, businesses went out of business. Michael, tax policy impacts what what we do, the three of us do as sales brokers more than anything else. If you look at last year was the highest volume in the history of, of Manhattan, 4.2% of the stock sold. The second highest year on record was 1998. Well, why was that? That was the year in which Clinton dropped cap gains from 28 to 20. And the fourth highest year was in 1986 when everybody was rushing to beat the 87 capital gains tax increase. So there's been some talk in Congress about eliminating capital gains tax rates altogether and just making everything ordinary income. That would put us out. Yes. I say knackle for president. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no but, but, but you know, that brings up a very interesting point that someone brought up to me uh, yesterday. And basically, you know, we've had 12, in a similar manner, we've had 12 excellent years under Mayor Bloomberg uh, mm -hmm. over here who owed no one any political environment and now we have a an election coming up with a variety of candidates and you know each one you know this one owes the union a relationship this one has a, over the thing over there and it's a very strange environment and you know real estate taxes go up water and sewer goes up sure. you know and, and you know fine they're getting the return that they're talking about like Nat says or you said four percent but you know when that water goes up and the real estate taxes go up and well aside from up. the aside from the expenses uh, on the Democratic side of the slate all of the potential candidates today have uh, advocated for a zero percent rent increase for rent regulated units what would that do to your business it would Aaron? kill it and the other thing is what you just said I was talking to a very sophisticated real estate guy and he said he feels Christine Quinn is going to be the next mayor and real estate taxes are going to go through the roof. So he's Public. not buying. So there are people who are starting to say that too. So as much as we're optimistic and we're saying everything is great, there are so few things that could just tilt everything. We, we model today when we're looking at, uh, especially multifamily property, any property in general, we're modeling real estate taxes going through the roof our, roofs mm -hmm. ourselves. We can't assume that on the takeout, if I'm going to be in something for five, seven, ten years, I can't assume that on the takeout I'm going to have anything less and, than and you know, we also, 5 percent of you. You know, we also don't have the, the tax abatements. You know, you only have the tax abatements on an 80-20 building. Mm -hmm. um, a, a friend of mine said to me, you know, he's selling his building and there's no more tax abatements. Changes the world, you know. Uh, the new person's going to work on a different basis, a different yield, but, you know, when you don't have tax abatements, 21% of your operating expense is, is real estate taxes. It's a, it's a totally different world. Yeah, Michael, who the next mayor of New York City will be will have a much more profound impact on our commercial real estate market than the result of the, mayor, the, the federal Absolutely. presidential election had. Mm -hmm. I agree. But our, our buyers taking that into effect today when they're buying? Some, very few, but some. I don't think most people understand the impact that Michael Bloomberg has had. I mean, I, I think that we all can appreciate what it is. I mean, I, I would certainly contend that the greatest mayor of New York City ever. Um, although I would remind everybody that one of the first things that Bloomberg did was raise real estate taxes really substantially. Um, but, you know, having said that, um, I think most people don't really have forgotten Right? They're so used to the city working the way it does that they've kind of forgotten what the mayor means to that. It's the first person that's really brought kind of an overarching vision to the operation of New York City and what New York City could be. Let's talk about other asset classes. You know, um, the James Hotel was recently sold, close to $800,000 a key. 
Uh, that's reaching high numbers. We're talking about today uh, 650 uh, Madison Avenue, which I remember when it was sold in the other time and then when it was recapitalized, it may sell. One three, well, right? One four. Oh, one four. four. Uh, the Sony building sold, you know, for one uh, one. one. Mm -hmm. So we, we're at prices on a level. Uh, and some of them, you know, the, there's a question of when the the return comes in because, you know, Sony is going to be a vacant mm -hmm. building in two years. Yep. And you have to hope that the world is going to be great, you know, and, and this situation. How do you see the different asset classes, retail, hospitality, uh, warehouse going to New Jersey office as in, in the sales market? Matt, Bob? Well, oh. Sorry, Bob. Yeah. So um, we have a press um, breakfast once a quarter, and um, we were talking about the market and sort of the Sony deal and the upcoming 650 deal, and uh, the comment was made, you know, condo eats office building, right? I mean, it's an amazing situation where you have modern office buildings, not downtown, you know, 1910 vintage office buildings, but modern office buildings that the highest value is no longer office. I mean, that, that's a shocking statement about you know, where the condo market is in particular, that it can just sort of subsume that kind of product. You know, a number of years ago, and I don't, it, it was publicly acknowledged, but it kept quiet. Uh, you know, um, Vornado owns the office uh, office building on the corner of 57th Street in Madison. Fuller. And they were not renewing leases mm -hmm. for the simple reason that they were planning to convert it to Mm -hmm. uh, residential condominiums, and they were keeping that in a, in a situation because they had other property over there. And you're right, uh, condo has been eating office buildings as opposed to Lower Manhattan, where they were eating office buildings because they were not really good properties for mm -hmm. office buildings. How, we, uh, since you spend a lot of time in Brooklyn, how is the Brooklyn market today, just in general, and the other assets? It's on fire. It's it's more on fire than Manhattan because the exponential increase is much higher. You know, you're selling stuff, and again, it's the old crude way of doing it, which was multiples, but the stuff that I was selling for six, seven multiples are now going for 11, 12, even 14. Well, you know, I threw out Brooklyn. Almost every neighborhood in Brooklyn population growth has is at the highest rate right. of anywhere in the city, more so than anywhere in Manhattan, and it's almost universal throughout you know, every neighborhood. We do have, you know, we heard about the Bronx, we heard about Manhattan, we've heard about Brooklyn. <clears throat> I haven't heard about... What's everybody's thoughts about Queens and that other little borough, which you have to go through by bridges or, you know, New Jersey. There, you know, not New Jersey, <laughs> Staten, Staten Island. What about Staten Island? Is there any activity out there? Staten Island, there's nothing for me. I don't even focus on Staten Island. As a banker, do you see any we much don't see activity? We very much yeah. on Staten Island. Not no. anything? No. We, we, we do Some. deals in Staten Island, and it's a, it's a interesting market. It is more Perfect. like New Jersey than mm -hmm. it is like New York. What about New Jersey? New Jersey, I think, unless you're near the Gulf Coast, Gold Coast, there's nothing that's really Well, you know, I, you asked about New Jersey, Michael, but you also asked about Queens a second ago. And I think the interesting thing about Queens is it has the lowest turnover of any of the boroughs. Ownership there, and on average, when someone buys a property in Queens, they hold it for 50 years. Mm -hmm. the average turnover is only 2%. But values there have gone up very, very significantly over the past 12 to 14 months. Uh, well, look, we're I, firm I, believers in, in Queens. As, as uh, you know, I, and Island I believe, you know, with what's Long Island City for a different reason. I think Long the Island City, be, because of the, the transportation mm -hmm. over there in Long Island City and also the, what's going to happen with Roosevelt Island, the fact that Roosevelt Island has limitations on what you can do when you need people to live yes. nearby and work over there. So I think that the investment market, Mr. Pessimist, is seeing... A little bright, rosy, but you know, I'm, I, I don't wear my rose-colored glasses. So I'd like to thank Aaron, Brooke, thank Nat, and uh, my friend Mr. Knackle. And if you want, you can watch these shows on the iPad app. I'm going to even teach Bob how to do it. See you next week. <laughs>